Good evening, I'm Brenda Wood, and this is Dimensions of Prophecy. Revelation, the 10th chapter, is the topic of tonight's discussion. This is a chapter about which Bible commentaries usually don't say anything. Books on the Bible usually pass it by. Most preachers don't preach about it. Yet it is one of the most important chapters in the entire Bible. It deals with our day and the time in which you and I are now living. Tonight's topic is the time of the end. Listen carefully as Pastor Cox explains the difference between the time of the end and the end of time. Let's join him now as the meeting is just beginning. I'm very happy to welcome each of you again this evening. Tonight we're going to take a look at a chapter in the Bible that you will find that preachers normally don't preach about. Bible commentaries just kind of pass it by. They don't say much about it. Books on the Bible very, very seldom mention it. And yet it's an extremely important chapter because it deals with our day and the time in which we're living today. And that chapter is Revelation, the 10th chapter. And we're going to go directly to that chapter and see what it has to say about it, starting with verse 1. It says, I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, clothed with a cloud, a rainbow was on his head, his face was like the sun, and his feet like pillars of fire. He had a little book open in his hand, and he set his right foot on the sea and his left foot on the land, cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roars, and when he had cried out, seven thunders uttered their voices. And when the seven thunders uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and do not write them. Now you'll find that God uses angels many places in Bible prophecy. For instance, if you go to Revelation, the 14th chapter, you'll find there are three angels there. Each one of those angels has a particular message. If you go to Revelation, the 18th chapter, it talks about an angel that came down and the earth is lightened with the glory of that angel. These angels that are used throughout the book of Revelation represent messages that the world is to hear. This angel in Revelation, the 10th chapter, is no different because it says that his right foot is upon the sea, his left foot is upon the earth. He has his hand raised to heaven, and he's shouting out a message to the whole world. It's a message that the world is to hear. Now, let's see what message that this angel is proclaiming to the whole earth. And the angel whom I saw standing on the sea and on the land lifted up his hand to heaven, swore by him who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and the things that are in it, and the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are in it, that there should be no more delay, or as it says, should be delay. No longer. It says that he has his hand raised to heaven and he's shouting out to the whole world that there should be delay no longer. Now, the old King James Version puts it just a little better, and I like the way it says it better, and it actually says that there would be time no longer. So if you can get the picture, this angel has his hand raised to heaven and he's shouting out to the whole world that time should be no longer. Now listen as he continues. And in the days of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, the mystery of God would be what? Finished as he has declared to his servants the prophets. Now if you pick up the scripture, you'll find that it talks about the mystery of God the scripture also talks about the mystery of iniquity. The mystery of God, when it uses that phrase in scripture, that is the mystery of the plan of salvation, the gospel. And what that text is saying, that the mystery of God would be finished. In other words, it says that the gospel message has been given to the whole world, that the gospel has come to an end that it should be finished, that he has his hand raised to heaven, and he's shouting that time should be no longer. No more delay. 
that it's come down to the end, that it's over. Now listen carefully, because now something begins to develop. The voice which I heard from heaven spoke to me again and said, Go take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel who is standing on the sea and on the earth. So it says the angel tells John to go and take the little book. All right. And I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. So he's told to go take the little book that's in the hand of the angel. He's told to eat it. As he eats it, he says it will be sweet in his mouth, but it's going to be bitter in his stomach. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it. And it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. And when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. Evidently, there is something about this message when this angel has his hand raised to heaven and he's shouting out that time should be no longer, that there should be no more delay, that the mystery of God is finished. There's something about that message, something contained in this book, that was going to be sweet as honey in his mouth, something that would bring hope, something that they would enjoy that in that message that that angel is proclaiming. But he said after they had proclaimed it, it would be bitter in their stomach. Now you noticed that it said that this angel had a little book, and it says that little book was what? It was open in the hand of the angel. That little book, you'll find, is also mentioned in the book of Daniel. You see, all the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation fit together. In fact, every prophecy in the book of Daniel is repeated in the book of Revelation. And so you'll find this little book mentioned in Daniel, and it has this to say about it. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the what? The book, even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. So Daniel is told to take the book and what? Seal it. Another place in Daniel, he said, shut it up and seal it unto the time of the end. But when you get to Revelation, the little book is opened. So it says that it was to be shut, it was to be sealed, unto the time of the end. Now, you understand tonight the difference between the time of the end and the end of time, don't you? Hmm? You understand that? It uses both terms in Scripture. It talks about the time of the end and it talks about the end of time. For instance, when I was a boy, oh, sometime in September, my father would go to town and he would buy a turkey, bring that turkey home, and he had a large cage there, coop, and he would put that turkey in that coop, and he gave me the job of feeding that turkey and watering it. He told me how much I was to feed it, how well I was to water it, and he wanted me to make sure that I did that. When my father put that turkey in that cage or that coop, that began the time of the end. Are you understanding? All right. But when Thanksgiving Day rolled around, that was the end of time. Okay, he said, shut it up, seal it unto the time of the end. As we study Bible prophecy, and we've studied a number of prophecies here together, but as you study Bible prophecy, there'll be one date that will come up time and time and time again that begin the time of the end, and that date that will come up over and over in Scripture was 1798. We'll find that that date is mentioned in Daniel, the 7th chapter. It's mentioned in Revelation, the 12th chapter. It's mentioned in Revelation, the 13th chapter. It will come up over and over, beginning the time of the end. He said, shut it up, seal it unto the time of the end. Many people up until that time, 1798, tried to read the books of Daniel tried to understand the book of Revelation, but they just couldn't seem to understand it. In fact, ministers referred to the books of Daniel and Revelation as closed books. 
I still run on to people say, oh, those are closed books. They couldn't understand what they were talking about, but in 1798, about that period of time, all of a sudden there were some ministers that had been studying the books of Daniel and Revelation. One of those men that had been poring over the books of Daniel and Revelation was a man by the name of Joseph Wolf. Don't know if you've ever read about Joseph Wolf, Joseph Wolf or not. Joseph Wolf was a Jew, was converted as a boy, gave his heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, and decided he wanted to become a minister. Went to school, went to the seminary, and became a minister. And he had a great, great burden for his own people. And he went over to Palestine and began to preach to them over there. If you want to read about him in the library, he is known as the missionary to the world, one of the great missionaries. I mean, moved across the whole continent after continent and preached the Lord Jesus Christ. But Joseph Wolf had been spending a lot of time in the books of Daniel and Revelation. As he was studying the book of Daniel, he came to this text in Daniel 8 and verse 14 that we studied the other night that said, And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. He began to study that, and as he was studying it, it so happened that all the churches back then, Baptist, Methodist, Episcopalian, Roman Catholic, all the churches believed that the cleansing of the sanctuary mentioned in this text, they believed that the cleansing of the sanctuary really meant the cleansing of this earth by fire. That's what they believed, all of them. Joseph Wolf is pouring over that chapter. And as he gets down to the end of the 8th chapter, he doesn't understand quite what's happening. And he begins to read the ninth chapter of Daniel. And you remember Daniel didn't understand it, and God sent an angel to explain it to him. You remember reading that chapter? And the angel Gabriel comes and explains to Daniel that vision that he saw there. Joseph Wolf began to read it, and it said, Know therefore and understand, from the going forth the decree to rebuild and restore Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, three score, and two weeks. Sixty-nine weeks. And Joseph Wolf sat down and began to study that, and he found out that that decree was given by King Artaxerxes in 457 B.C., and he began to trace it, and as he traced this 2,300 days there, it brought him to the date 1843, and when he got to that date 1843, he said, Jesus is coming because he believed that the cleansing of the sanctuary meant the cleansing of this earth by fire. And he said, Jesus is coming, and Joseph Wolf began to preach all across Palestine that Jesus was coming in 1843. At the same time, not connected with Joseph Wolf, but living at exactly the same time, there's an Episcopal minister by the name of Edward Irving over in England. He is studying exactly these same prophecies. And he begins to trace the same prophecy, and it also brought him to 1843. And he began to preach across the British Isles that Jesus Christ was coming in 1843. He was joined by 500 other Episcopal ministers, and it moved across all the British Empire at the same time. Not connected with Joseph Wolfe, not connected with Edward Irving, but living at the same time. There's a Roman Catholic priest down in South America by the name of Manuel de la Cunza. He's studying exactly the same prophecies. And as he's studying those prophecies, those prophecies step by step brought him to 1843. And he wrote a book called The Coming King, and it circulated across South America, and thousands and thousands of people believed that Jesus was coming in 1843. At the same time, 
not connected with any of these men, but living contemporary with these men is a man here in the United States by the name of William Miller. William Miller is a Baptist minister. He's been studying these prophecies for nine years. And as he has studied them over and over, it's brought him to the date 1843, and William Miller is preaching that Jesus is coming in 1843. He was invited by a congregational church in Boston to come and preach there. He went to this church and preached. Took that prophecy in Daniel 8 and 9, and he traced it step by step, and it brought him to 1843, and when he finished that sermon, the young minister of that church, Joshua V. Himes, stood up, and he said, Mr. Miller, do you believe what you're preaching? And William Miller said, I wouldn't be preaching if I didn't believe it. Then he said, why don't you do something about it? And under the tremendous genius of this young man, they began to make every large city across North America. They would go in there and they would pitch tents. And I'm not talking about little tents. I'm talking about tents that would seat 25 and 30,000 people so big that the railroad company would have to run tracks out to the tent just to take care of the people that came by railroad. They would pour out to those meetings and William Miller would preach that Jesus was coming in 1843. Among those people that was there was a man by the name of S.S. S. Snow, a young Methodist minister. That young Methodist minister was impressed with what William Miller had to say. He went back home, he got his Bible, he got every history book he could get his hands on, and he began to study that prophecy. As he poured over that prophecy and he took history and he traced it step by step, he found out that that decree given by Artaxerxes in 457 was given in the fall of the year. And so as he traced it step by step, it brought him not to 1843, but it brought him to October the 22nd, 1843. 44. S.S. Snow went to see William Miller, sat down with him and he studied that whole prophecy and as they studied that together, William Miller could see that he was right. They called a Bible conference. They brought people in from all across North America and people even came from Europe and other parts of the world. And they met at that Bible conference and this young minister, S.S. Snow, stood up and presented that paper to that whole Bible conference, and those people voted that Jesus was coming on October the 22nd, 1844. They went out of that Bible conference electrified. They called it the midnight cry. They said, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. And they preached it everywhere they went, and they told people that time was running out that time should be no longer, that the mystery of God was finished. They got down on their knees. They confessed their sins. They got their lives ready for the coming of Jesus Christ. They believed it with all their hearts. It was something that they longed for, something that they believed, something they desired. It was in their mouths as sweet as honey. They longed for the coming of Jesus Christ. They said time should be no more. They got ready for the coming of the Lord. October the 22nd, 1844 came. They went out to meet him. They went out and they stood in fields facing the east waiting for the Lord to come. All morning long they stood there looking, waiting, watching for the Lord to come. Noon came and passed, and on into the afternoon they stood, and finally the sun began to set, and darkness began to cover the earth, and they encouraged one another with words and said, He'll come at midnight, and on into the night they stood, waiting, longing, looking for the coming of the Lord. Midnight came and passed, and the sun 
began to rise the next morning, and that that was in their mouths, as sweet as honey, became bitter in their stomachs. Jesus didn't come. Now let me tell you something, friends. If you are intellectually honest and you take that chapter in Daniel 8 and 9 and you study it out, it'll bring you to 1844 every time. There wasn't anything wrong in their interpretation of the date. What their problem was is they were saying that time should be no longer. They were saying that the mystery of God should be finished. They were saying that Jesus was coming. That's what they were preaching other than what the prophecy said. But let me tell you something. The Bible said they would do it. God predicted that they would do it. That they would be greatly disappointed that it would be bitter in their stomachs. Now, I read to you all the verses in the 10th chapter of the book of Revelation except the last one. I want to read you the last one, the 11th verse. And he said to me, you must prophesy what? What? Again, about many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Now, that version, that's the New English version, it says about. The word there would be much better, too. In the old English, it is too. And he said, you must prophesy again to many people, nations, tongues, and kings. Prophesy to them about what? Huh? That time should be no more. That the mystery of God should be finished. That's what they were to prophesy again. And it bothers me. It bothers me greatly when I find Christian people, people that are supposed to be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ that don't have the slightest idea of when Jesus is coming back. I stand absolutely aghast when I hear people say, oh, we don't know when the Lord's coming. It could be thousands and thousands of years. And I wonder what's wrong with them. Said, thou must prophesy again. And tonight... I want to talk to you about the coming of the Lord. No, Jesus didn't come. Jesus didn't come because there were certain messages yet to be preached, like these three angels in Revelation 14. I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made heaven and earth and sea and the springs of water. It's one message he was to preach, that the hour of God's judgment is come. And let me tell you something, dear friend. I don't know each one of you, but let me tell you, if you're going somewhere to a church where you never hear anything about the judgment, you never hear anybody tell you to get ready for the coming of the Lord, they don't preach about the judgment, then you better look some more. I'll tell you that for sure. And it says, And another angel followed them, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And dear friend, let me tell you, if no one ever says anything to you about Babylon, they don't ever tell you anything about the mystery of Babylon, they don't talk about the fall of Babylon, then you're not being prepared for the coming of the Lord. And a third angel, third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on his forehead or in his hand, and if you're going somewhere and they never say anything to you about the beast, they never tell you what its mark is, they don't tell you what the image is, they don't concern you with it at all, then, dear friend, I'm telling you, you're missing it. You need to get ready. Those are messages that men and women were to hear before Jesus comes. But the problem is, as I run on to a lot of Christian people 
that keep wanting to tell me that Jesus is going to come as a thief in the night. Oh, I talked to them. They said, oh, Brother Cox, we don't know when the Lord's going to come. He's going to come as a thief in the night. Then I want to tell you something. You get out your black book, and I'm going to let you write something down. And don't forget it. If Jesus Christ comes as a thief in the night to you, you're lost. That's right. You just put it down. If he comes as a thief in the night to you, you're lost. Because that's what it says here in the Scripture. Paul's writing, listen. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write to you. Paul said, I shouldn't have to write a word about this. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a what? A thief in the night. And people say, all right, there it is, Brother Cox. It says he's going to come as a thief in the night. The problem is most people stop reading right there. You need to keep reading. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes on them as labor pains on a pregnant woman, they shall not escape. But you, brethren, who's he talking to? He's talking to Christians. He's talking to followers of the Lord. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We're not of night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Sure, Jesus is coming as a thief in the night, but he's coming as a thief in the night to the lost, not to the righteous. Dear friend, it's not to come upon you as a thief. I can tell you right now, if I know a thief's coming to my house, you better believe I'm going to be watching and waiting. That's simply what it's saying. It doesn't come upon us as a thief in the night. But some people want to think God, of God as a God of confusion, as a God that doesn't know what he's doing. I don't believe that. I believe God has done everything exactly on time. I believe he will always do things on time. People, when you talk about the coming of the Lord, they say, oh, Brother Cox, we don't know the day nor the hour. Well, listen to what it says here in Matthew. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that he is what? Near even at the doors. I don't know the day. I don't know the hour. And I'm not going to make an effort tonight to tell you the day or the hour. But I am going to make an effort to tell you it is near. That I am. And I hope I can get across to you how near it is. Christ has, God the Father has done everything according to plan and it's gone off like clockwork when it came to the time for Jesus to be born. This is what it says. And when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son born of a woman born under the law. You remember when he was at the wedding at Canaan? And his mother asked him to do something, and he turned the water into wine. Do you remember that? He responded by saying to her, Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. What he was saying to her is, You're rushing me. You're pushing my ministry ahead of time. That's why he's talking. He's trying to tell her it's going off like it's supposed to. Don't move me ahead. And as he hung there on the cross, so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And let me tell you, he died on time. And you put it down, he's coming back on time. Better believe he is. The thing of it is, there's a text of Scripture that I hear people quote quite often. And every time I hear them quote it, they always quote it out of context. It's found here in 2 Peter, the third chapter. It's verse 8. I'm going to read several texts to help you get the con context of what it's talking about. It says, knowing this verse, that scoffers will come in the what? Last days walking according to their own lust. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Now, it says that this is scoffers in the last days, and they're saying, where's the promise of what? His coming. All right. 
For this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then was being flooded with water, what? Perished. Peter's saying, these scoffers are going around saying, where's the promise of his coming? He said, those people are ignorant. He said, they've forgotten that that's what they said in the days of Noah and the old world was flooded. Now listen carefully. Peter brings it to our day. But the heavens and the earth which now exist are kept in store by the same word reserved for what? Fire until the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. Now, this chapter is talking about the coming of the Lord. It's talking about the end of time. It's talking about the destruction of this world. That's what it's talking about. Now, listen to verse 8. But, beloved, do not forget one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. I hear people read that text and they say, well, that just means God's not concerned with time that just one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. God's just not concerned with time. No, it doesn't. It doesn't mean that at all. In fact, it means just the opposite. Listen to the next verse. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness. Peter said, don't take what I'm saying to mean that the Lord's slack. No, he's not slack but is long-suffering towards us, not desiring that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. What's Peter talking about when he says, concerning the coming of the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. What's he trying to tell us? Well, if you pick up your Bible, you'll find that God uses the number seven many, many times. In fact, the number seven is used over 50 times in the book of Revelation alone. You can read there about seven churches. I can read to you where it talks about seven seals. It talks about seven spirits. I can read to you where it talks about seven woes. It talks about seven plagues. It talks about seven thunders. It uses that word seven over and over in Scripture the number seven indicates completeness. That's what it means. Okay? All right, now I want you to do a little thinking with me. Because I'd like for you to tell me, where do we get a year from? What gives us a year? Okay, we get a year from the Earth's orbit around the sun. It takes it approximately 365 and a fourth days to make one orbit around the sun. Where do we get a month from? From the moon. From the moon's orbit around the Earth. It takes it approximately 30 days to make one orbit around the Earth. Where do we get a day from? Well, we get a day from the Earth's rotation on its axis. It takes it 24 hours to make one rotation on its axis. Now, I want you to tell me, what heavenly body, the sun, the moon, the stars, the Earth, what heavenly body gives us a seven-day week? Come on. The only place you get a seven-day week from is right here, friend. That's where you get a seven-day week. I don't know what the evolutionist does with that. That's where you get a seven-day week is from that book. God gave us a seven-day week. Right back in the beginning, he gave us a seven-day week. Now, I want you to listen carefully to me. I don't want to be misunderstood. I don't want to be misquoted. Okay? When God gave us a seven-day week, each one of those seven days was 24 hours. Do you understand me? Each day was 24 hours. I run on these people that say each day was a thousand years. No, no, no. You can't get any more than 24 hours out of an evening and a morning. Okay? Strictly 24 hours, and I don't have enough time this afternoon this evening I wished I did just to spend some time in this area because I can tell you there's a whole lot more evidence 
for creation than there is for evolution. A whole lot more. Okay, each day was 24 hours. But when God gave this earth a seven-day week, each one of those days represented a thousand years, a thousand years of time that God would give this earth for sin to run its course. That's what Peter's saying. One day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is a day that God has given this old earth seven thousand years for sin to run its course. Now, notice some scripture with me. Leviticus 25, verse 4, but in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the what? Not to the people, to the land. A Sabbath for the Lord, thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. They could till the ground, they could plant their crops, they could do all that for six years, but the seventh year they had to let it lie. It's a Sabbath of rest unto the land. Then shall the land enjoy her Sabbath as long as it lieth what? Desolate. And ye are in your enemy's land, even then shall the land rest and enjoy her Sabbath. I hope you're thinking. I told you last night you remember needed to remember something. It says here, the land shall enjoy its Sabbath as long as it what? Lieth desolate last night. We talked about a thousand years in which the earth was going to be desolate. And we found out the earth would be desolate. We found out that the righteous were going to be up in heaven during that thousand years. Now, what I'm trying to get across to you tonight, what I'm trying to tell you is tonight, we happen to be 13 years from a completed 6,000 years and the beginning of the two thousand or the seven thousandth year, two thousand AD. That's what I'm trying to get across to you. That tonight we are thirteen years from a completed six thousand years and the beginning of the seven thousandth year. Now, what I don't want you to do, I don't want you to go out of here tonight and tell anybody that Brother Cox said Jesus was coming in two thousand AD. Because if you do, that's not what I believe. You will be misquoting me. I'd like to tell you what I do believe. This is what I believe. Matthew 24, 22, Unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be what? Shortened. I don't think you've got 13 years left. That's what I believe. The Lord said he would shorten it. And I wished I had time tonight, dear friend. Go out and read. Read about the pollution of this old planet. And there's enough scientific evidence to tell you that time's quickly running out for this planet. When he says no flesh saved, he's not talking about spiritual salvation there. He's talking about total annihilation. It's what he's talking about with the pollution. When we started the arms race, here a while back, we already had enough bombs made to kill every man, woman, and child on the face of the earth 14 times. Not to say what we've developed now. The book of Romans it says he will finish the work and cut it what? Short in righteousness because the Lord will make it short work upon the earth. Now, I don't know when Jesus is coming. I'm not endeavoring to say he's coming in 2000 A.D., what I'm trying to tell you tonight is we're down to the wire. Time's running out. You can go on and you can say, well, it doesn't make any difference, and you're going to be caught short, friend. That's what I'm trying to get across to you. And we're running out of time. It's not going to go on and on and on. It's coming to an end. Whether it happens in 13 years, whether it happens in 15 years, it's not the issue here tonight. The issue is it's down to the wire. That's the issue. That's what I'm trying to get across to you. You remember, Jesus has sent his disciples 
couple of his disciples into town and they had gotten this young donkey. They brought it there, put a blanket on its back, and Christ had gotten on its back and they started riding towards Jerusalem. And as they're riding towards Jerusalem, one of the children ran out and he said, Hallelujah, the king is coming. And pretty soon another child ran out there and he said, Praise the Lord, the son of David's here. And pretty soon another child ran out and he said, Praise God, the king has come, the Messiah is here. And pretty soon there were more children. And then all of a sudden people begin to gather and they begin to pull palm branches off the trees and wave those palm branches and they said, The king has come, the Messiah is here. And they took off their coats and they laid them down before that donkey as Christ rode towards Jerusalem and as they got close to Jerusalem some of the Pharisees come running out there and as they ran out there they said to Jesus don't let them say that stop them stop them and Jesus said you stop them and the very stones will cry out and let me tell you something if you and I don't do what God called us to do dear friend before Jesus doesn't come back in on time those very sidewalks out there will cry out. We're down to the end. Time's running out. Jesus is coming back. Oh, dear friend, he's telling you, he's telling me, get ready. Coming. Coming soon. I want you to listen tonight as Sylvia said. Our subject tomorrow night is seven steps to feeling great. You know, I run on to Christian people that actually believe the Lord wants them to feel bad. Really. I run on to Christian people that look like their religion gives them a headache. And if it does, you ought to get rid of it. It's true. You see, the Lord said he came to give you life and to give it to you how? More abundantly. God wants you to be happy. He wants you to enjoy life, and that's what we're going to be talking about tomorrow night. Seven steps to feeling great. It's a subject you don't want to miss because you'll find it'll be a great, great help to you as we take a look at God's Word and what He says about feeling good. So we hope that each of you can be back with us tomorrow night. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, tonight we thank Thee for the promise of a soon-coming Savior. We ask that each one of us may be ready to meet Thee. Lord, help us not to put it off, to place our lives in Your hands, to trust You. May each one here walk by faith, reach out and take hold of the hand of Christ, and walk with Him all the way into the kingdom. For this we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Good night. God bless each one of you.